Hello and welcome to Thursday in Parliament, our look at the best of the day in the Commons and the Lords. On this programme, MPs defend the rights of the displaced Chagos Islanders. These are British subjects and they are entitled to the same rights and freedoms and self-determination that all British citizens should have. Yeah, yeah. Would lives be saved if we lowered the drink-drive alcohol limit for motorists? One peer says, don't do it. The social life of rural people would be hugely damaged uh, and the, it would be the death knell of the rural pub. And what is the best way of securing the future for our local post office? If uh, the post office were Tesco, they wouldn't be thinking about closing profitable branches. They would be thinking how to make those branches more profitable. But first, the Foreign Office announced this week that Chagos Islanders, who were expelled in the 1960s, will not be allowed to return to their homes on the Indian Ocean islands. Families were forced to leave the islands, a British overseas territory, by the government when the islands were leased to the United States to build an airbase at Diego Garcia. The Chagossan community was largely resettled in Britain and has long campaigned for its right to return home. One campaign leader called the Foreign Office decision shameful. A minister told MPs the government had looked at the issue closely. The government has looked carefully at the practicalities of setting up a small, remote community on low-lying islands and the challenges they would face. We were particularly concerned about the difficulty of establishing modern public services, about the limited health care and education that it would be possible to provide, which would be difficult for any new population and especially for elderly Chagossians returning to the islands. The government had decided against the resettlement of the Chagossan people for practical and security reasons. The government is creating a significant and ambitious support programme to provide Chagossians with better life chances and is developing an increased visits programme. But does he understand the shock, anger and dismay amongst the Chagossian community here in the United Kingdom in Mauritius and Seychelles that were displaced from their homeland in the 1960s at the government's decision yesterday not to allow resettlement. Does he not realise that these are British subjects and they are entitled to the same rights and freedoms and self-determination that all British citizens should have? Yeah, yeah. How can the government defend the right of self-determination for the people of the Falkland Islands and Gibraltar and other overseas territories but completely deny the same rights for the people of the Chagos Islands? We are told that feasibility is a factor. But why has that feasibility not been tested by means of a pilot programme of relocation as, con as considered by KPMG? Mr Speaker, the treatment of the Chagos Islanders is a dark stain on our country's history. Yeah. Yesterday's decision and the way that it was made has done nothing to remove that stain. It is another disgraceful attempt to cover it up, but it won't be covered up. The Chagosians can be assured that on this side of the House, led as we are by someone who has campaigned for them for 30 years, we will never give up on their right to return. Uh, I believe the Chagos Islanders have a right of return, uh, and I'm very disappointed by yesterday's statement by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Uh, I note uh, a compensation package uh, being uh, proposed of uh, of, of, uh, 10 million, of £40 million over uh, 10 years. Uh, can the uh, Minister say uh, a little bit more of how that will be spent in local communities, such as mine uh, in Crawley? And rather than just regretting the uh, forced eviction of Chagos Islanders from their homeland, will the British Government now apologise? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Mr Speaker, yes, I'm very prepared and do apologise. And that is why compensation has been paid, and it, that has been recognised uh, by the courts. And the shame of uh, successful administrations is not something dating just from the 1960s and 70s. It covers the last 15 years, where successive administrations have used every effort through the courts to block and tackle the rights of the Chagossians, including use of the royal prerogative disgracefully against Her Majesty's subjects. So instead of apologising for the past, will the Minister address properly the future 
and allocate to these people the right of self-determination and their right of return. The Minister's statements about no right to self-determination will of course have much wider implications and will be listened to by many people in other islands and rocks around the world. Could he make it clear to those people who may have a shiver down their spine this morning about this statement that there is no further intention by Her Majesty's Government to roll back self-determination anywhere else? If I can interpret, if I may, and I think this will be to the satisfaction of the Honourable Gentleman, uh, that he is implicitly also referring to sovereignty. And may I make it absolutely clear to this House, Mr Deputy Speaker, that questions as to the existence or presence of a population on the British Indian Ocean Territory do not affect our position on sovereignty. Sir Alan Duncan. Ministers have confirmed their dropping proposals to limit the lawmaking powers of the House of Lords. Last autumn, David Cameron indicated the government would restrict the ability of peers to vote down measures under what's known as secondary legislation, after peers had rejected the government's planned cuts to tax credits. But now the Leader of the House says ministers have had a change of heart. We recognise the valuable role of the House of Lords in scrutinising SIs, but there is no mechanism for the will of the elected House to prevail when they are considered as is the case for primary legislation. The government is therefore reliant on the discipline and self-regulation that this House imposes upon itself. Should that break down, we would have to reflect on this decision. This House has an important role to play in scrutinising and revising legislation, and the government recognises this. As we find ourselves considering the legislation resulting from the decision of the British people to leave the European Union, the constructive approach this House has so far shown will be ever more important. For Labour, Lady Smith said the review had been an absurd overreaction. The tax credits vote that led to this review were exceptional. They fulfilled the criteria. It wasn't just a matter of disagreeing, but in completely in line with the history and conventions of this House and the current report. My Lord, the noble lady referred to Brexit, and over the past few weeks has been considerable speculation about the role of this House, your Lordship's House, in examining Brexit. My Lord, I think we've been clear. We will not block, we will not delay. But a government without a plan does not have a blank cheque. Clearly, this House will have an important role, especially if there is considerable secondary legislation that will need us to work together to provide extensive scrutiny from all sides of the House in, in the public interest. In the light of yesterday's suggestion that the Brexit process might lead to upwards of 2,000 SIs being produced, could the Government give an assurance now that it won't abuse the SI system in future by including in statutory instruments substantial policy issues which should rightly be the subject of primary legislation. What the Government has done uh, 12 months on is to have listened very carefully to the voices uh, around the House and decided that the best way forward is the way the House always proceeds, which is by agreement, at a pace and with perspective. It is true that the guidelines on when secondary legislation is to be used in primary legislation are vague uh, or indeed opaque. And I very much urge the government to work with the parliamentary draftsman and indeed make public through departments when it is most desirable to use secondary legislation and then we can avoid these sorts of issues in the future. A Lib Dem said governments often wanted to clip the Lord's wings but the Lords were determined to hold on to their right to say no. And the warning and the danger is that if we ever gave away that right to say no, sparingly as it used, the dynamics of this House would change. We would become a debating society. One of the frustrating things noble lords often feel, indeed members in the other place too, about statutory instruments, is it's a take it or leave it. Uh, there's no chance to amend. Uh, and I know during the course of the discussions, evidence given to committees, uh, that there were some suggestions as to how it might be possible uh, to advise some procedure which would allow amendment of, of statutory instruments, because very often it's maybe just one small part uh, that people feel ag aggrieved about, and we should be willing to take that on board and give serious consideration, uh, not to let the thing just finish here, but to see other ways in which we can actually improve the scrutiny of statutory instruments. Yeah, yeah.
Again, I am not going to make any promises I can't keep, but I'm very happy to say that we will, you know, I want our, this House to work effectively. I want us to be, make sure we use our expertise properly, and I, would, I do want to improve the processes that we have if we can. Can I congratulate the Government for the decision? I have really one simple request, and that is to ask the Government, and it seems to me a golden opportunity, what it is going to do to explain to journalists and commentators using this as a lever about the role of this House, because it is the supreme ignorance, and I agree it's amongst the other House, which I shared before I came here, it is the ignorance amongst journalists and commentators about our role that led to the kind of ignorant interview the public heard on Radio 4 this morning. So can we use this as an opportunity to explain to the media, as many of us do with the Peers in Schools programme, about the exact role of this House? This seems a golden opportunity for the Government, on an all-party basis, to do something about that. And Lady Evans said she agreed there was a lot of work to do to improve the public's understanding of the work that the Lords did. The government has announced a further £10 million for a scheme to improve the resilience of a key rail line in south-west England. It was in February 2014 that strong winds and high seas severely damaged the rail line running through Dawlish. Part of the sea wall and 80 metres of track was washed away. A team of engineers battled for two months to repair the breach. In the Commons, the Transport Secretary told MPs it was a priority to ensure that the line did not suffer a repeat of the storm damage. I believe we need to continue to improve transport links and rail links in the southwest. But for me, the number one priority is making sure that the resilience around the Dawlish seawall and the Dawlish cliffs is dealt with. Uh, and I can announce to the House today uh, that the requirement for the next stage of the project uh, of a further £10 million so that we can continue to develop the programme of dealing with this issue once and for all, that funding will now be granted and that work will now go ahead. This is an important part of ensuring that we protect essential rail links to the South West and I hope people in the South West will see this as a commitment to making sure they have a proper transport yeah, system yeah, for the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Later, Labour raised the problems faced by travellers on Southern Rail that has been hit by cancellations and strike action. Is the Minister content that Southern Rail customers face this daily commute hell every day, or is he going to act to do something about it? No, I'm not at all content. Uh, and of course, the biggest step that could be taken would be for the rail unions to call off their action yeah. so that we could deal with some of the underlying infrastructure problems that also exist, as I described a moment ago. And one of the things I find sad, Mr Speaker, is far from joining us in calling for these strikes to end so we can improve the situation, the party opposite seems keen as to line up with the militants rather than oppose them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, Southern Rail was a disgrace before the current industrial action. Yeah. It will continue to be a disgrace long after the current industrial action is, is complete and, and is settled. The Department for Transport set the routes, they allocate the franchises, they dictate the number of trains that run and they set the fare increases. So when is the Secretary of State going to stop pretending that this has nothing to do with him, blame everybody else around him and act to stop this daily hell on this rail? Well, uh, Mr Speaker, I have every intention and I'm working as hard as I can to address the issue, but what I would say to the Labour Party is this. Figures published this morning show that across our railways far more, more than twice as many problems arise as a result of infrastructure problems which are in the public sector rather than train operation problems which are in the private sector. Their arguments, persistent arguments, that say we should nationalise and that will solve the problem are just plain wrong. We need to invest and interestingly, Mr Speaker, unlike the party opposite, we are doing so. Now from rail to road travel, the session also saw ministers pressed to take action against the German car maker Volkswagen, which has come under fire for fitting devices to its diesel cars that cheated emissions tests. As consumers in this country look around the world, they look to New Zealand, Brazil, France, Germany, South Korea. Action is being taken against companies like Volkswagen. Well, this government lets people down, drags its heels. Can I hear something firm about what the government has been doing to take them to task? Minister of State. Well, Mr Speaker, the honourable gentleman underestimates me. Uh, it is... It is... 
It is, it, is, it is true. It is true that in a hard world I have a soft heart, Mr Speaker. But those companies that either care less for their workers or treat their customers without integrity will soon learn that in the, my velvet glove there is a steely fist I'm unafraid to use. And to that end, I have met Volkswagen twice. I am absolutely determined that they should meet their legal obligations. The costs that, they, that we've endured as a government as a result of them will be met by them in full. And I can tell this House today that I've received a pledge from Volkswagen to pay £1.1 million, which taxpayers have had to spend as a result of their behaviour. And I expect to receive that cheque before Christmas. You're watching our roundup of the day in the Commons and the Lords. Still to come, should the drink drive limit be lowered? Now, could the traditional town centre post office become a thing of the past? Some 60 main or crown post offices are due to close their doors around the country in the latest rolling closure programme. In some cases, under franchising arrangements, some post office services are reappearing inside other high street shops. Opposition campaigns to the closures are being mounted in some areas. And in Westminster Hall, a series of MPs described how post offices played important roles in their local communities. Could we please look at every post office as a centre of the community, but also look at the loss that we're having in villages, towns and parts of cities where the library has gone, the pub has gone, the school has been closed down, the bank has gone, and actually start working with councils, parish councils, whatever community bodies are there, to try and identify the places that we must save that are the community hub and keep the post office. So rather than let these decisions be made, not talking to others, please let's work through them and try and hold everything together. If uh, the post office were Tesco, they wouldn't be thinking about closing profitable branches. They would be thinking how to make those branches more profitable by providing a more attractive and alternative services to the customer. So this is what I would like my honourable friend, the Minister, to really take away from this debate today. Let's see how we can make the post office work better uh, for its customers. So what the post office needs is a proper business model for the future, which above all needs to consider how much of the business should be commercially profitable and which bits of it the government, through the taxpayer, is prepared to subsidise. The post office must be, remain as a vital public service and a community resource for the long term, with secure jobs and good terms of conditions for all its employees. My own preference is that a future Labour government should bring Royal Mail back into public ownership and create a comprehensive integrated postal industry using internal cross-subsidies where necessary and appropriate. I imagine that may be expecting too much of the present Tory government, but it would be undoubtedly be massively popular with the public and serve us all well for the future and for the long term. We need to know that our post offices have a future and that that future is in the public sector, as promised. We need a plan for our post offices, and we could do worse than explore the measures undertaken in France for its post offices when it established La Banque Postale. Excuse my pronunciation. And it isn't just the French who seem to be able to run postal services better than the current government. The Italians have also made a huge success uh, of getting a post office bank uh, up and running. Similarly, New Zealand has got a uh, highly successful um, post office uh, bank established in the last um, 15 years. We have lost post office after post office in rural communities, and you can wax lyrical about the emotions of it and the effect on rural communities, but they are very real. When you are talking about some of those scattered, remote, rural communities, you take the pub, you take the church, you take the, the school out, the final blow is when you lose the post office in that community that does have that galvanising role. Please, could um, the, min the minister give us reassurances as a new minister, new opportunity to listen to us genuinely and give us a positive voice. People want their Crown post office. Listen to our voices and think again rather than implementing these foolish and unpopular proposals. We cannot keep these Crown po um, post offices open, losing money and stick to our commitment to keep the post office open in the rural and semi-rural areas where very often it's the only service they've got left and I think really um, for some of these crowns that are closing for customers to be walking a very short distance away sometimes into a more convenient location to a WH Smith is a, a very small price to pay to keep this network operating across the country which is, which is proven not economic.
Margot James. The approach of the run-up to Christmas has traditionally been the time for campaigns warning about the dangers of drink driving. But does the alcohol limit for drivers need to be lowered? In England and Wales, the current permitted limit is 80 milligrams of alcohol per 100 millilitres of blood. In Scotland, however, the limit was reduced two years ago to 50 milligrams of alcohol in 100 millilitres of blood. Plenty of scope for discussion at question time in the House of Lords. The RAC Foundation last year said that uh, 25 lives would have been saved if the, um, if the limit had been lowered. And Police Scotland is just about to produce a report on their two-year trial. If their report suggests similar findings, will you use that evidence to reduce the limit at the next available opportunity? We've previously said, and indeed I've said from the dispatch box, that we will look at the evidence which is presented from the, uh, in, uh, the programme that was initiated in Scotland. We'll reflect on the evidence and the experience there and then uh, take forward any reviews we need to. But let me make it absolutely clear, we currently have no uh, uh, reviews planned or indeed we're not looking to review the limit as it stands. And I'm glad to hear the Minister is resisting the pressure to drop the limit further, which I think the limit at the moment is well accepted. And he will know that, in fact, most accidents are caused by people who are well over the limit. They're likely to ignore any limit. Yep. There is another basic reason for not dropping it further, and that is the social life of rural people would be hugely damaged, uh, and the, it would be the death knell of the rural pub. Um, it is so important that people be able to have a, a reasonable level of drinking to be able to go out to do so and to destroy that sociability in rural areas, which a further limit would certainly do, would I think be a grave mistake. Of course, the general advice is that you know, if you have a drink, resist, the, uh, resist or make alternative arrangements for driving. And I think before reviewing any such thing, we need to look at the evidence base. And when you look at our record here in England and Wales compared to the rest of Europe, actually we have one of the best road safety records in the whole of the continent. I very much take the point made by the noble Lord, Lord Vincent. Um, but living 10 miles into Scotland myself, I was in fact breathalyzed um, the other morning at half past 10 and much to everybody's amazement did in fact pass, but is it not madness? <laughs> but is it not madness that one does have a, a different limit in Scotland and a different limit in England and Wales? Well, I'm uh, glad to hear of the noble Lord's uh, passing of the actual test. I think the important issue is there are certain powers that have been devolved and in that respect, Scotland, the Scottish Government took a decision to lower the limit. As of next year, there will not just be a different limit in Scotland, there will be a different limit in Northern Ireland. So can my noble friend, the Minister, please outline whether there are any plans to have a United Kingdom-wide public information campaign to ensure that people know that in different parts of the Kingdom there are different laws on drink driving? And could he outline what consultation that has been had with victims' groups because there may be victims of accidents who will find that the criminal law takes action against the driver in one part of the country, but not in another part of the country for very similar uh, behaviour. Would he agree with me that the level of distraction uh, and loss of concentration which comes from the use of mobile phones is probably equivalent to several units of drink? Yeah. The noble lady is quite right to point out the concern and indeed We've seen, regrettably, uh, re most recently, the effects of people who are distracted through the use of mobile phones. The government is looking at that area very seriously and is looking at strengthening uh, the actual uh, use of mobile phones. Well, arguably, one of the most controversial additions to the House of Lords in 2016 was that of Shami Chakrabarti, who's the former director of Liberty. When the Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, appointed her to the Lords in the summer, there were claims that it compromised her apparently independent inquiry into allegations of anti-Semitism in Labour. Lady Chakrabarti has now made her maiden speech in the Lords during a debate on higher education. Like so many of your Lordships, I owe every life chance that brings me here to a wonderful British education, <coughs> including, in my case, a legal education that was free up to degree level and even supported by a full maintenance grant. For the daughter of migrants to this country, 
real ones, wonderful people. That education was key, as was the opportunity, whilst at university, to rub along with students and teachers from all over the world. Lady Chakrabarti. That's it for this programme, but do join me for the week in Parliament when we have a studio chat with the Labour MP in charge of the committee that's keeping a close and watchful eye on Britain's EU departure process. But for now, from me, Keith McDougall, goodbye. <laughs>